Over the past eight months, the Israeli left has been carrying out a very uh, complex and uh, sophisticated and successful uh, operation against its political opponents in Israel uh, that are represented by the Netanyahu government. And we're going to go into um, some of the most extraordinary aspects of that uh, in a case study of something that happened uh, on August 4th. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of this discussion, we'll be able to understand uh, what is actually happening, what these supposedly uh, pro-democracy uh, c- protests, or whatever you want to call them, are really about, and uh, how they're being carried out. So without further ado, uh, let's start. On August 4th, um, there was a Friday, about 40 minutes before uh, Shabbat began, a shepherd from the uh, Jewish community Ostzion in the Benjamin region, one of the regions that's been most afflicted by Palestinian terrorism over the past six months, was coming back with his herd to the community before Shabbat began. And he was attacked by three Arabs from the surrounding or the neighboring Arab village of Bork. Uh, he called up uh, his friends uh, from his community to come and help him get away. Um, and then uh, and some of his friends came. And then the three Arabs who were attacking him called their friends. And dozens of people arrived from Borka. The Jews again called for more help. And more people came from uh, Ostzion to help them. Uh, throughout this time, uh, the Jews were always uh, smaller in number than the Arabs. Uh, by the end of this event, uh, there were several hundred Arabs from Borka who were attacking the Jews. They were attacking the Jews in what appears to have been an attempted lynching uh, with, um, with, with rocks, with uh, metal rods, and with incendiary devices like firecrackers and fireworks from a distance of, um, uh, actually from no distance, from point blank range, attacking the Jews uh, and uh, and beating them. And uh, over this period, many of the Jews from Ostzion were wounded and they were falling by the wayside as the Arabs kept approaching them as the Jews were trying to walk back to Ostzion. The entire event apparently happened on public lands between Ostzion and Borka again, in the Benjamin region. Um, at a certain point, this, the entire event, and uh, this is, uh, according to people uh, who have been covering this on the ground, um, took place over a two-hour period. So well after Shabbat came in, after the sun said, all of these people are very religious, they don't use electronics uh, on Shabbat, um, but they were calling for assistance from the IDF, um, and according to some reports, the IDF uh, didn't come for a long time. Uh, according to others, they had misdescribed where everything was happening, so the uh, forces arrived at the wrong place. Whatever the case, to according to the people, the eyewitnesses, the people who were at the events on the ground uh, at the time, um, one of the uh, residents of Ostzion um, uh, was um, was uh, shooting his gun in the in the air every now and then in order to try to distance the Palestinians, distance the Arabs from Borka, from the uh, from the Jews who were trying to get away from them. His name was Yifiel Indor. Um, and Indor was uh, harshly attacked. He was critically wounded uh, by a uh, blow to his skull. He fractured, his skull was fractured. He was, he had uh, cerebral bleeding from uh, from the fracture and from the blow. And as he was falling uh, to the ground unconscious, he apparently shot off the last round from his gut. Um, and uh, at a certain point, uh, it was claimed uh, that he had killed one of the Palestinians who was in this crowd. Now, after two, two hours, uh, this ended. At a certain point, the army came, the police came, uh, the ambulance came and took uh, Indoor to 
Shari, Shari Tzedek Hospital in Jerusalem, where he was hospitalized in the ICU. He underwent a very complicated uh, surgery on his brain to stop the bleeding uh, and to uh, set his fractured skull. He remained in the hospital for 10 days. Um, none of this was known uh, until after Shabbat went out on Saturday night in Israel because the people who were involved on the Jewish side of this uh, attempted lynch uh, didn't speak to the media. But at the same time, the Palestinians, of course, did. And the Palestinian authorities' propaganda outfit, the Wafa so-called news agency, uh, put out a report claiming that uh, the Jews in question had entered Burqa uh, with the uh, premeditated plan to kill Arabs, that Indor had deliberately murdered uh, in an act of terrorism the Arab who apparently was killed by his bullet when he was shooting it in the air, and that everything was provoked, the entire events took place in inside of the village and they were deliberate acts of violence political violence aka terrorism that were carried out by so-called settler extremists against innocent palestinians in the village of bork uh, we've been dealing with the palestinian authorities propaganda machine that simply manufactures lies and blood libels against jews in israel and of course around the world, and sends them out into the world, at least since the establishment of the Palestinian Authority in 1994. Uh, the PA's media's press or, or record in terms of telling the truth is abysmal. Uh, it has no, it feels no necessity to tell the truth. It feels the necessity to be used as a, as a uh, political warfare um, tool against the Jewish state, against the Jewish people, and that's how the Palestinian Authority uses Wafa and its other media organs, and that's how they are constituted, and that is how they carry out their so-called media operations, which is really just an information war against Israel. All the same, despite the fact that the Israeli media is well aware of the role of Wafa News Organization in the propaganda war that the Palestinian Authority has been waging against Israel since its inception, despite the fact that the IDF is aware of Wafa's role as a propaganda arm, despite the fact that the United States State Department understands Wafa's role as a propaganda arm of the Palestinian information war against the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Both the the IDF spokesman Moshe Hagari uh, put out a statement about what had happened, based entirely on the Wafa story, alleging that Israeli terrorists had carried out this act of wanton violence against the Palestinians, and presenting and characterizing these Israelis from Ost Zion as terrorists. And like the IDF spokesman, every single media organization that was operating in Israel on Shabbat were putting out the Palestinian propaganda report as truth, castigating Mayor Hindor, his friend Elisha Yared, and the other Jews that were beset by this Palestinian Arab uh, lynch mob um, as terrorists themselves, misreported the location of the attack, and got all of the other significant details relating to the attack wrong. So by the end of Shabbat, the narrative had already been seeded and spread throughout the world that we had just seen a Jewish terrorist attack against guileless Palestinian villagers inside of their village that had led to the murder, the deliberate premeditated murder of a Palestinian age 19 whose name uh, was widely publicized throughout the world as a, as a victim of Jewish terrorism. The State Department issued a harsh condemnation of the settler extremist terrorists, demanded an accounting and justice for the victim, expressed their solidarity with the victim's family and their sympathy for their loss. All of this without waiting for Shabbat to end to hear even minimally what happened on the Jewish side of the fence. Nobody reported that Indor had been hospitalized. Nobody reported that he had been critically wounded and that he was undergoing 
emergency uh, surgery and being and and being hospitalized in the ICU. None of this was reported at all. I happened to be in the United States, so by the time Shabbat was over here, the truth had already come out. So I heard the report for the first time, along with the uh, version of events that uh, Indoor and Yared's friends were finally able to release after Shabbat was over. So the first time I came across this story was after the truth was already coming out. Of course, nobody wanted to report it. Um, and not only that, it's important to note that Ronen Barr, the director of the Shin Bet, uh, capitalized on this early propaganda uh, claim from the Palestinian Authority as the basis of an interview that he gave, I think it was to Israel Hayom newspaper, talking about the threat of Jewish terrorism and how Jewish terrorism levels had gone up in recent months. And here we saw just another capstone of a growing phenomenon of Jewish political violence, of terrorism against the Palestinians. Again, Hagari was stating that terrorists on both sides, as if he's from the UN and not the spokesperson for the Israeli military, he was making the statement that the terrorist is a terrorist is a terrorist, right? And it doesn't matter who they are, they're all horrible. And the underlying understanding was that these Jews were terrorists, no better than Hamas. So the story comes out. Nobody wants to report it, obviously, because they had this beautiful narrative that everybody was pushing from the Times of Israel and Jer Jerusalem Post to every uh, uh, major Hebrew media organization except for Channel 14, which, of course, wasn't broadcasting on Shabbat because they don't broadcast on Shabbat. Um, and yet, truth is a difficult thing because uh, the uh, police had to request for Yared to be remanded to custody of under suspicion of terrorist murder, and they produced no evidence of the claimed crime. And so the magistrate's court judge, looking at what they had, said, you have produced no evidence that anything like this happened. Reports finally began to, to uh, find their way into the media that none of this happened in Borka, that it happened outside of Borka. The IDF was forced to acknowledge that it didn't happen in Borka. It happened outside of Borka, and that it wasn't at all clear what had happened, and the Jews may have actually acted in self-defense. Yes, think. At any rate, um, so the magistrate judge uh, had to really fight tooth and nail with both the police, with the Shabak, and most importantly with a state prosecution that was, put, and was pushing this concept that Yared had deliberately been an accessory involved in terrorist murder of this Palestinian who was killed. Um, and he was finally uh, remanded to house arrest. He was released from jail against the uh, wishes of the uh, of all of these uh, security organs. And uh, even the Supreme Court got involved. A justice uh, of the Supreme Court said, well, no, I'm going to keep him in jail. Uh, you can't uh, you can't have him released until you know you have another hearing in the magistrate's court. And she started her ruling on Akronen, the justice, one of the very well known radical leftists on the court, but whatever. Um, and the defense attorney for for a year had said, "But wait, you haven't even heard our argument." She said, "Oh, that's right. Uh, give your argument, and then I'll make my decision." She had already written her decision. She started giving it before she heard the defense, and then she gave her decision because she didn't really care what they had to say. Later in the day, the, ju the judge in the magistrate's court let year it out. So this is a complete miscarriage of justice and, of course, a media malpractice of the highest degree with a collusion of Israel's security brass that are advancing a narrative which doesn't seem to have any relationship to the events in, in reality. As for Indoor, they're simply not letting go of him. They're not letting go of him. He was released from Shari Tzedek and sent not home to recuperate from his wounds, but uh, to uh, uh, Masiao Prison, where he's now in the hospital ward because he's still very, very sick. <laughs> and uh, he's still being charged with murder, although they said now they've taken away the terrorism aspect of the charges. Uh, and and another aspect of this, of this case that's very troubling is that... Um, we never saw the autopsy of the dead Palestinians, so there's no 
way of actually knowing the cause of death because the Palestinians aren't releasing that information. By the way, they did the exact same thing uh, about a year and a half ago. I think it was with the uh, death of uh, Al Jazeera reporter Shirin Abu Akhle, who was embedded with Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists in the middle of a gunfight in Jenin against the uh, IDF forces, that she was killed allegedly by the IDF. Um, but she was a uh, legitimate target since she was embedded with terrorist uh, forces who were engaged in an illicit gun battle against IDF forces at the moment of her death. At any rate, uh, the Palestinian Authority refused to release her autopsy to Israeli investigators at, or to the United States for that matter. And yet the State Department, as was the case on August 4th, so too in Shirin Abu Akhle, they simply uh, accepted at face value the Palestinian claims again without any reason to do so, given the Palestinian Authority's track record of simply making things up and lying all the time, both in their rendition of events and also in their claims of uh, Israeli responsibility and guilt for uh, deaths of Palestinian terrorists uh, and during terrorist attacks, or in the case of Shirin Abu Akhle, a terrorist sympathizing journalist who was acting as a propaganda arm of the Iranian-controlled Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorist organization operating in Jenin. At any rate, uh, we don't actually know what the cause of death of the Palestinian is, and yet the, the police guided, according to senior police officials, or, or acting under duress due to massive pressure from the state prosecution that wants to maintain this prosecution of both Yared and Indoor uh, for murder, even though from day to day the information that's coming out uh, again weakens more and more the Palestinian claims and the prosecution's case, the prosecution, according to reports from Channel 14, uh, really couldn't care less. And so Indoor was just brought before a judge in chains from the hospital in La Ciao prison. He can barely walk. And you can see here uh, the video of him walking uh, into the courtroom. What is he doing there? Why isn't he at home recuperating from his wounds? It's malice. It's part of the Israeli left information war against uh, a religious Zionist. Here I just want to uh, make a larger point. Okay, so in in the wake of the misreporting of the events of August 4th by every major Israeli media organization and the immediate embrace of this fake narrative by the U.S. State Department, by the IDF, by the Shabak, and by the police, and of course by the state prosecution and by Anad Ron, the justice of the Supreme Court, um, you know, they you've had these media people and these former generals, again, who are acting as just leftist lunatic in their statements to the media, are coming out and describing religious Zionists in general as the enemy of Israel, as terrorists. There have been calls by senior reporters like Ron Edelis from Ma'ariv, Chaim Levinson from Haaretz, who also is a frequent commentator and host on major radio stations, including Army Radio. Uh, saying that um, religious Zionists should be barred from serving in the IDF, that they're our enemy, that they are terrorists, etc., etc. And these aren't mere words. These are fighting words. Uh, Chaim Levinson said that he considers himself to be at war with religious Zionists, and he isn't the only one. Again, senior generals have been saying, Rob Levine, uh, the former commander of the Northern Command, we'll get to him again in a second, but he said uh, he referred to Israel's control over Judea and Samaria as a crime worse than Nazi Germany. He likened it to Israel, to Nazi Germany, and to apartheid South Africa. But these are completely delusional, anti-Semitic uh, blood libels and were described as such by the definition of anti-Semitism put out by the International uh, Holocaust Scholars Association, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. And yet here you have senior journalists in Israel uh, retired g generals, chiefs of staff, um, commanders of the Air Force, and others repeating these anti-Semitic canards in relation to religious Zionism. And the religious Zionists 
who have always been the enemy of uh, of the sort of secular left, uh, of course, are now just the third. I mean, I was sort of waiting for this to happen, but the the information war that the left has been carrying out against uh, all of the people in Israel who are not on the left uh, began uh, with a similar propaganda campaign against uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews who uh, they refer to as blood-sucking parasites. Where have we heard this before? Der Sturmer, anyone? Uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, anyone? Um, so Haredi ultra-Orthodox Jews are parasites and blood suckers uh, who are freeloading on, on Israel, who are unproductive members of Israeli society. And it doesn't matter. You know, it's like I, I was a lone soldier. I volunteered for IDF services. I was I was uh, inducted into the service six weeks after I made Aliyah by myself at the age of 21. I served in the army as an officer for nearly six years. Um, and yet um, I am constantly being attacked as a freeloader tourist from the United States uh, and who never served in the IDF by the left. So, you know, I don't even know why I'm bothering to say this. I'm just using it as an example of the constant lies that are coming out. You know, so the Hari, I don't, this is the first time that I've mentioned it because I know I say, who cares? But you see the Haredi and, and their supporters and defenders are like, this is not true. The majority of Haredi men work. The overwhelming majority of Haredi women, you still don't over, you know, in the high 50s of Haredi men and in the, yeah, in, in over 80% of Haredi women are working, are productive members of Israeli society. And I'm just sort of like, I'm looking at these numbers and I'm looking at the data and I'm looking at the apologists coming out and giving the truth about Haredi contribution to Israeli society. And just as I don't feel like saying, how can you say that I didn't serve in the IDF when I was, when I did, you know, uh, um, I feel like, why are people feeling like they have to expose what a lie it is? Well, you have to, because people are beginning to believe it. They see, and this is periodic, we see it, you know, from time to time, every time that the left comes out with more stuff, another campaign, another ass assault on their political opponents in Israel, it always is replete with this completely mendacious, utterly false propaganda and libels, blanders against people on the right. So you have the the ultra-Orthodox, you have Sephardim, uh, you know, the majority of Israelis come are Sephardic Jews. My husband uh, is Sephardic, so our, you know, we're, our family is, is both, and uh, it, it just makes me so sick to my stomach. But, you know, they, they constantly refer to Sephardic Jews as primitive, as stupid, as corrupt, and, you know, their bet noir, the one that they love to push against the most, is Dev Allen was a, 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 a minister in the justice ministry, and every single appointment that he tries to make, they insist it's corrupt, even though he's not doing anything corrupt. Uh, you know, you have people who are non-functioning, who, who, who he's trying to fire, and they say every time that he tries to fire them, this is corrupt. Everything is corrupt. Why is it corrupt? Because he's Amsalem and the racial undertones, the racist aspect of the assault on Likud members is so palpable and it's so in your face all the time. And nobody is making any effort to hide the fact that they simply are racist. That they hate Sephardic Jews. Uh, it, you know, it goes with the blood sucking uh, parasites who are Haredim and the terrorists who are religious and, and messianic nut jobs. You know, I, I put out this thing. On Friday, it was, it, it's interesting and edifying, I guess, to uh, be uh, in the United States uh, when Shabbat comes out in Israel because I get to see stuff that I don't usually see, which is what the left puts out during Shabbat in Israel. And so, yeah, you know, there there have been uh, prayers, uh, Shabbat prayers going on in uh, Dizengolf uh, Square in Tel Aviv for years. I know some of the young people who participate in them. I think it started with Corona, but I'm not sure. And they have these beautiful. Shabbat evening prayers and uh, and they sing and they're there and anybody who wants to join can and anybody who doesn't want nobody bothers them. So these leftist uh, activists were filming them and and demanding an explanation from the mayor of Tel Aviv how he permits these messianic messianic extremists to operate openly in such a misogynist way, right? Because traditional Jewish prayers of men and women separated. You know, none of them have any problem with what happens uh, in Muslim prayer. Some of it very public in 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 uh, 
on the streets of Tel Aviv. Uh, that doesn't bother them at all, but Jews celebrating uh, on Friday night, Shabbat, uh, in central Tel Aviv, as far as they're concerned, that's an, a fascist. They refer to it as a fascist assault by messianics against the liberal order of Tel Aviv, and they demanded an accounting and an explanation from uh, the mayor of Tel Aviv, who himself has called uh, for civil war and Ran Huldai and for uh, political violence. He was one of the first people calling for civil war, I think, begin go going back in, in February, the early days of the leftists, uh, political war, psychological war against Israel, against uh, against their political opponents to try to bring down the government and 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 really plunge Israel into a chaos, the likes of which we've never seen. So, um, you know, this this is something that uh, we don't like to remark on, or we're so overtaken by events. But I'm so just just distraught over what has happened with uh, Indoor, uh, who was so severely wounded, and he's being treated as no terror victim has ever been treated in Israeli history. I don't think. And yet there it is, and we're watching this play out in real time in the courtrooms in Israel, and it's such a miscarriage, not only of justice, but of morality, that, that this is allowed to go on, and with the active collusion and support of uh, the Israeli media, of the American media, of the American Jewish community, of the State Department, of the Shabak, of the IDF, I think it really points to some of the, the brutal corruption of uh, some of the uh, most important institutions in Israeli society, and I would say first and foremost, the media. I mean, I saw uh, when I first tweeted about this, somebody sent me, how dare you say that? And they bring me the Times of Israel write up, which I, you know, I, I avoid that website because it's just become a abysmal uh, trash sheet. And I, I can't believe that, you know, David Horowitz and some of the other people there who I've long respected are, are, are doing this. But the report in the Times of Israel, you know, if you go down and actually read, they acknowledge that this is all based on Wafa's report. How can this be? Well, it is, and it's not just, obviously, it's not just the English report, but also that's led by the, the Hebrew media. But this is, you know, th this is this is really what we're seeing. And here I just want to go to a couple more things because I think it's important and we have to see them in context. So... On Sunday, I think it was Sunday morning, this uh, uh, leftist uh, political warfare, and I would argue actual warfare organization, which actually does uh, commit and uh, undertake uh, acts of political violence against their political opponents to advance political ends, which of course is the very definition of terrorism. They're called Brothers in Arms. Neshek, they walk around with khaki t-shirts on. They were the ones who were undermining and trying to upset uh, uh, the Memorial Day uh, ceremonies at uh, Israel's war cemeteries on uh, on Memorial Day. Um, and they're the ones who were carrying out violent assaults on the offices of uh, the Kohelet Forum beginning already in, in March that we've described uh, and um, and against uh, members of the of the government and Knesset members with uh, riots outside of their homes. So they've been very violent, very vocal. They're the ones who were throwing dollar bills, fake dollar bills at uh, Haredi. They started pushing dollar bills into the uh, collar of Mayor Rubin, the uh, the uh, uh, director of of uh, Kohelet, who came out to try to talk reason to them. Uh, um, and instead of listening to him, they assaulted him physically and were pushing these dollar bills. But of course, they they care about Israel. Obviously, they they just happen to be extremely anti-Semitic or 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 happy to engage in rank anti-Semitic attacks on their political opponents. So on uh, Sunday morning, I believe it was, they started posting a new PR campaign, which is what uh, a direct call for uh, murder of senior uh, ministers in the government. They've shown. Uh, first, they put up uh, posters of Defense Minister Yoav Gallant in black with a uh, target around his face and bullet uh, bullet wounds uh, or bullet marks in the target. Uh, they also put out similar uh, posters of uh, Finance Minister Bezalel Smotrich with his face and a target and bullet uh, pock marks around the target on his face, same, I understand, of Itamar ben the uh, national security minister is in charge of the police. So they also put out um, coffins 
outside, bleeding coffins outside of the offices of the political parties of Smotrich and Ben Gvir, uh, calling them terrorists and their voters terrorists. Again, this goes back to the uh, mischaracterization, I would argue the criminal mischaracterization, the slanderous mischaracterization of events on uh, August 4th outside of the uh, villages of Borca and uh, Ostion. Um, and uh, if you want, you can add to that um, the other uh, psychological warfare operation that the media and these retired generals are carrying out. So um, you have uh, all of these continued coverage claims, allegations by senior military correspondents that uh, uh, the chiefs, uh, chief of staff of the IDF, Herzia Levy, along with Renan Barr, the head of Shabak, and uh, Mossad director, um, uh, are going to be, Duri Barnea, are going to be making a joint statement about to the state the state of our security apparatuses and that they're going to do so to inform the public. And uh, Netanyahu, that came out on Sunday morning. It was a report by uh, Channel 12's senior military correspondent near Dvori. All three services immediately put out a blanket uh, um, uh, denials of his claim, saying that no such plan was ever made. It was a complete fabrication and a lie. I, I believe it was, but I believe as well that Nir Dvori didn't make it up all by himself. It's true that he's been a mouthpiece and a spokesperson for the left's insurrection against his political opponents in Israel and against the state of Israel for the past eight months, but I don't think that he was operating on his own, just as he's been fed by propaganda from a lot of people inside and outside of the military uh, for the past eight months, so it was probably the case with his statement. But if that isn't a statement or a threat for a military coup, I don't know what is. And then there's been all of this mischaracterization. I don't know what the actual truth is, but it's clear that it's distorted coverage of a meeting that Prime Minister Netanyahu had in the IDF, uh, in the Ministry of Defense headquarters in the Kiryat in Tel Aviv on Sunday with the Chief of Staff of the IDF, Halevi. So I don't know exactly what happened, but they're portraying it as Herzi Levy telling Netanyahu, uh, laying down the law that you better stop the judicial reform or it's going to destroy the IDF. You could argue that if that's actually what happened, that the proper response that Netanyahu should have given to Herzi Levy is, where have you been for eight months? Why haven't you, have you refused to take action against these people calling for an insurrection inside of the ranks of the IDF? You've been enabling this and facilitating this for eight months. I don't know what happened, but I can assure you, just given the track record of the media and Israel, that this too has been mischaracterized. The truth is somewhere else, but what is clear enough is that whether it's Tomer Bar, the commander of the Air Force, who has been making public statements that are incontestably political and politically motivated and detrimental to the IDF as a fighting force, so too, uh, the truth about what's happening is that uh, fed by a constant stream of incitement by former chiefs of staff of the IDF, former Mossad directors, former Shin Bet directors, the current leaders of Israel's uh, general staff, IDF and Shabak, are under tremendous social pressure from their predecessor uh, uh, to carry out an effective coup against the Netanyahu government. And we're seeing this play out in real time. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So you've had the former uh, Mossad chief, Tamir Pardo, former deputy chief of the Mossad, who's now a member of Knesset from uh, Yesh Atid and was the uh, chairman of the Knesset's Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee in the last government, Ron Ben Barak, claiming that Netanyahu is a graver threat to Israel than Iran. And Amir, Amiram Levine, the one who referred to Israel on Saturday night, has uh, likened it to Nazi Germany and apartheid South Africa because we're in control of uh, Judea and Samaria. Um, he as well has, uh, has made statements of this nature, uh, accusing Netanyahu of being a threat to national security. Um, so, you know, these are, these are things that, that are stunning. If you watched or haven't watched, you should watch. Uh, my interview this week on the Carolyn Glick Show with uh, Richard Goldberg from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He was, uh, of course, you'll remember from his previous uh, 
visit to the show. He was the point man in the Trump National Security Council on Iran and its nuclear weapons program. So uh, we walked through uh, the unofficial deal that the Biden administration has apparently concluded now with the Iranian regime that gives them, uh, uh, cements their position as a threshold nuclear state with no capacity on the American side to prevent them at any given moment from becoming an actual uh, nuclear state. So this is a clear and present danger to Israel's very existence in the United States under the Biden administration is facilitating that threat rather than uh, adding it with Israel. They're betraying Israel on this. The deal itself is a massive betrayal of the American people and, of course, of the nation of Israel. Um, This is a moment of utter peril for Israel. It's a time when our army, such as it is the Mossad especially, have to uh, be carrying out operations to block Iran's path to a nuclear uh, 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 arsenal. And uh, and uh, yet uh, we're seeing that we are being assaulted by a political war, an information war, a psychological war, by our own people, domestic uh, people uh, on the left. Uh, in part of their political war against Israeli society or the, the, the majority of Israelis who don't support their uh, political positions, their ideological positions, and do not want to bestow them with political power uh, at this time. Uh, the question is, how, how does this end? And the answer is, I'm not sure, but as my colleague and and former uh, co-host of the Carolyn Glick Show, Gotti Tapp, said, as he's been saying, it's his new mantra, is that the left's uh, greatest weapon is ignorance, and our greatest weapon is knowledge. And the more we're able to put out, which is, of course, why they want to close down Channel 14 and uh, push uh, uh, people uh, who aren't leftists out of positions of influence in the Israeli media, more generally, um, we need to educate ourselves. I think I consider it lucky for me that uh, what I finally heard about uh, what happened uh, uh, outside of Burka and it was Sion on August 4th, the truth had already started coming out. Um, but I think, and I was able to report it on Twitter, and now I'm reporting it here uh, to you in this in this broadcast. But the more that we know uh, the more able we are to protect ourselves against this lie, against this horrible lie. I'll just say, you know, the aficionara of uh, Barack said, Girl Friday, uh, Shikma Bressler, who's this created media darling. You know, she's been feted by the New York Times writing this glowing portrayal of her as some sort of a uh, woman of the people and revolutionary it's a complete lie and we're being subject subjected to this at home and abroad this lionization of of this woman who's never you know who, who who's the head of the most media uh driven uh movement of political war against the elected government and democratically uh constituted organs of the israeli government She's now being presented as uh, something of uh, Golda Meir and Dira Gandhi wrapped up in a Leon Trotsky, and all of us are supposed to hail the new uh, chiefess of, uh, of the revolution, Shikma Bressler. Um, you know, and when she's anything but, she's a hired gun of Barack, who's been running this uh, influence operation against the Israeli people uh, since 2019. Uh, at any rate, so she's being lionized. We have to know the truth and we have to tell the truth and we have to share the truth which is what i'm trying to do now and what i hope you guys will do in sharing this video and i think it's really important for all of you also to be moving if you haven't already to jns as your primary english language news source uh from news in israel because quite simply uh the rest of the media is acting in a way that is just unforgivable as far as i'm concerned knowledge is our most powerful weapon to preserve the Jewish people, to, to preserve the Jewish state against this extraordinary assault at home at a moment of utter peril in our position in the region due to the actions of Iran 
and its proxies, particularly in Lebanon, and to the betrayal of uh, the Biden administration on this front. So I, I uh, urge you to share this video and to share this information uh, with your family, with your friends, and spread it out because this is the battle that we fight and we have to finally just win it. Thank you. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you.